Tonight, the devastation in Hawaii. People lost everything. There's still people missing. The search for survivors continues, and a wildfire ravaged Hawaii as residents begin to see the destruction for themselves. We'll have a report from the ground. Plus... The DJ's role in hip-hop is the impetus, is the nucleus of the whole thing. They are central pillars of hip-hop's long-lasting culture. Tonight, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of hip-hop by pointing the cameras to its mainstay, the DJs. And... How can something legally prescribed be killing so many people? It's a fictionalized telling of the real events behind the origins and aftermath of the opioid crisis in America. Tonight, we bring you behind the latest major series, Painkiller. Good evening, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Schulze in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more. Including why a judge abruptly decided to send former FTX CEO Sam Bankman free directly to jail, plus the major ruling on assault weapons that ensures they're banned in Illinois, and it's Beyonce summer as the Hives tour heads to a record-breaking finish line. We will have all the details by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with the horror in Hawaii as the grim reality is setting in for the weary wildfire victims beginning to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. The sheer scope of the devastation is becoming clearer as we continue to learn about additional lives lost as the apocalyptic inferno raged through the historic community of Lahaina. The wildfire is claiming at least 59 lives, and Hawaii's governor says that number is expected to rise. Right now, we are monitoring a Coast Guard update about the search and rescue mission as residents attempt to flee the area. We will bring you more as we get it, and as firefighters are still tamping down the burning embers. Families are now being allowed to return home, some arriving to find very little left. And amid the staggering loss, the aloha spirit runs deep through these tight-knit communities, dealing with this unthinkable grief. The people of Maui telling us they are pulling together to help each other with whatever is next. Whit Johnson leads us off tonight from Maui. Across Maui tonight, the catastrophic toll of this historic disaster coming into focus. Oh my God, it's not a fire. The massive fires claiming the lives of at least 55 people, though Maui's police chief says that number is expected to climb. I do not know what the final number is going to be, um, and, and, and it's going to be horrible and tragic when we get that number. And with no power, no internet, and no way to communicate in some places, authorities are still desperately trying to locate as many as a thousand people. The shelters here overcrowded. Hawaii's governor saying some residents will be able to return today to see their homes for the first time while asking others to open theirs. If you have additional space in your home, if you have the capacity to take someone in from West Maui, please do. I got about within two blocks of my house and everything was engulfed with flames. You saw the fire. Saw the fire. Kessa Stoddard and her family lost their home in the fire, leaving everything behind in just 10 minutes. Did you receive any kind of warning there that was the no, fire was coming into the town? No warning. We we are supposed to get, you know, on your cell phone evacuation alerts. notices, alerts. We got nothing. Nothing. Not one alert to evacuate. So your only signal to get out was the explosion and the flames? Yes, and the smoke and people leaving town. Tonight, mounting questions over whether officials sounded the alarm fast enough or whether power outages prevented alerts from reaching people. Was there a widespread alert? To no, no, there wasn't. Uh, it, uh, it, was, it seemed sporadic. I'm going to have to say that the government could have done a little bit better. The local government could have done a little bit better. Hawaii officials telling the Associated Press there are no emergency management records indicating Maui's warning sirens were activated Tuesday when the fires began. The fire chief asked about those alerts. Our department is not responsible for that. The fire that day moved so quickly that from where it started in the brush to where it moved into the neighborhood, um, communications back to those who make those notifications were physically and nearly impossible. In Lahaina, the once capital of Hawaii, which holds deep cultural and historical significance, the raging fires taking nearly everything. And we see it firsthand as we approach the harbor by boat. This is the historic Lahaina Town Harbor. I've been here a number of times over the years. This is my first time seeing it after the fires, and it, it's, it's unrecognizable. And it's difficult to get your bearings because there aren't many buildings left standing. 
People tell us that it all happened so fast. The flaming embers started raining down from the sky, igniting buildings all around them. And many had just seconds to flee, some even jumping into the harbor, into the ocean to escape the flames. Overnight, we spoke to emergency doctor Reza Dinesh, telling us he rushed into Lahaina with his mobile clinic and immediately began treating patients. And all of a sudden, I started getting some text messages from paramedics and firefighters that I know that went in and out. And like, Doc, there's bodies. There's bodies on the ground. Kessa Stoddard learned several of her close friends lost their lives in the fires, telling us tonight this community is strong, but still in desperate need. Right now, I don't, it's not about me right now. It's about the community and the people of Lahaina. And I'm just one of thousands of people with this story, one of thousands, and we, we need help. The spirit and strength of the community on full display, Wit, just incredible what that family went through, racing on their way home to stay alive. And Wit, though you are getting word today that some people are going to be allowed to see their homes in that Lahaina neighborhood, Yes, Elizabeth, we've been communicating with several families who are actually trying to get back into that Lahaina neighborhood now. The governor did say if people present the proper identification that they will be allowed past the roadblocks to see what's left of their homes. We saw a long line of cars of people trying to get in before we left. But it's not just Lahaina. We're actually in the Kula neighborhood here, and you can see this is just one of many homes burned to the ground, and it gives you a sense of the widespread devastation across the island. Elizabeth? Whit Johnson in Maui tonight. Thank you. Those images and stories coming out of Maui are just heartbreaking. Stephanie Evans and her family are among the thousands of people who lost their homes in the Lahaina fire. Stephanie joins me now. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for being with us tonight. You know, as we heard, residents are now being allowed to return to their properties there. Will you go? How are you preparing for what you might see? I... I think I decided I am gonna go today. They open the road at noon, which is in like 30 minutes. Um, I, I'm just nervous to, I know it's, there's nothing left but ashes, but um, I, I left my cats there. So I just wanna go back and see if they're around. If you can, and I can't imagine the pain you feel right now, but can you take us through the past couple of days for you to Tuesday night when those fires broke out? When did you realize you needed to evacuate? Kind of how fast did everything happen? You know, it was crazy because that morning they had said the fires were contained. We smell smoke. We went outside. I talked to my neighbors and we were like, are we okay? And they were like, yeah, it's the news reported it was 100% contained within like 30 minutes. So we were like, we're good. Um, my my mom thankfully brought my kids back. She had taken them for ice cream, just trying to keep them busy because the winds were making power lines fall. That you know, we had no power. She was just trying to keep them busy, and thank God she brought them back when she did because it was a matter of like. 20 minutes of being all together where we started smelling smoke again. But this time it was different because you could see the embers falling and the, this smoke came in so quick. I didn't have time to think. I just grabbed the kids and my purse and we just jumped in the car and left. And I thought we were leaving for like a few hours. I thought we would come back once it was contained again. I didn't think I was evacuating for for good, you know. You have two sons, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. How are you explaining yeah. to them what's going on right now? What was that moment when you had to take them and, and go? I just was like, it's real. We've got to get out of here. And, you know, of course, my my kids are kids, you know, they, they were like, I want my shoes. I want, you know, they're basketball players. They just wanted their little things. I like let him grab one thing. And I'm just like, I just knew it was so, something in me said it was different this time. And I was just like, we just have to go now. My older son has some asthma and I just didn't want him breathing that in. So I didn't really know we had lost our entire homes until about nine o'clock Tuesday night. We got a text from my neighbor who's a firefighter actually. Um, and he said, everything's gone. And so I just fell to the ground. I wasn't, I wanted to be strong for them. But in that moment, I just, I just started weeping and they just, you know, they were there for me. It, it was, should have been the opposite, but they really are 
really resilient kids. They're so strong. And so I'm so thankful that they're alive. There's a lot of kids that are not alive right now. And I'm so thankful that you and your sons are safe, you know, through this horrible tragedy. We have heard many heartwarming stories of community coming together. Talk a little bit about how crucial this community has been for you in these past couple of days, Stephanie. It's it's life changing for all of us because it's not just me. It's my neighbors. It's, you know, our basketball coach. He lives in our neighborhood like he's still running practice today. Like he's like we are not we're in this together. And so seeing and they're all going to show up with for the boys today with new shoes. I have people from the mainland sending the kids clothes. You know, they just we went to a card store. Just he loves collecting cards and we just went there and he just was like, my house burned down. I don't have any cards. And the guy just, they gave him so much stuff. It's heartwarming because as a mom, you have to keep going for your kids. You can't really stop parenting and being there and they don't really get the, the severity of it. So being able to have everyone support me so I can support them is just everything. And just seeing the community, we really are so strong behind it is it's such a tight knit community. Our school is gone, the kids school, and that's a huge community for me. And so we've been rallying behind each other and trying to um, just trying to help one another. What do you need? What can we do? You know, do you need housing? People don't have places to live. I'm so thankful and grateful that I have a roof over my head right now. Please know that we are thinking of you and your family and so many others in this tragedy. Thank you, Stephanie Evans, for taking some time to share your story with us tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. We move on now to the other major news this Friday night. The attorney general has elevated the U.S. attorney investigating Hunter Biden to the status of special prosecutor. It is a stunning turn for the president's son, who just weeks ago believed he had a plea agreement to end the investigation and settle the charges. Now it appears he could be put on trial. Chief Justice correspondent Pierre Thomas reports. Tonight, the president's son now under investigation by a special counsel and likely headed to trial. Hunter Biden still in the investigative crosshairs of federal prosecutors, still clearly in legal jeopardy. I'm here today to announce the appointment of David Weiss as a special counsel. It was a surprise announcement from Attorney General Merrick Garland elevating David Weiss, the Trump-appointed U.S. attorney who had already been investigating Hunter Biden for five years, to special counsel, due to what Garland called the extraordinary circumstances of the case. This appointment confirms my commitment to provide Mr. Weiss all the resources he requests. It also reaffirms that Mr. Weiss has the authority he needs to conduct a thorough investigation and to continue to take the steps he deems appropriate independently. And then another surprise, Weiss telling the court that the chances for a plea deal on the table just two weeks ago have all but disappeared. Weiss writing, the parties are at an impasse, and the government believes this case will not resolve short of a trial. No plea deal means Hunter Biden now likely facing prosecution on tax charges in Washington, D.C. and California and a gun charge. But Hunter Biden's team saying that Weiss's designation as special counsel doesn't change our understanding of his authority, and they expect a fair resolution not infected by politics. While Hunter Biden's supporters suggest he's being unfairly targeted because he's the president's son, many on the right have criticized Weiss for being too lenient. Tonight, some Republicans saying naming a special counsel is the right move. I think it's about time uh, that we saw the appointment of a special counsel to get to the bottom of not only what Hunter Biden was doing, what the Biden family was doing. The American people deserve answers, and I welcome the appointment. Others skeptical. Nobody in their right mind believes that making him a special counsel, Mr. Weiss, cleans up the mess that's been created. Pierre Thomas joins us now from the Department of Justice. And Pierre, this signals the investigation into Hunter Biden is far from over. Is there a possibility of more charges? There absolutely could be more charges. Weiss and his team has already indicated in court that separate and apart from that failed plea deal, that Hunter Biden's financial dealings are still being investigated. Elizabeth? Pierre Thomas, thank you. 
President Biden and the First Lady have said little about Hunter's legal woes, except that they love and support him. ABC's chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce joins us now. And Mary, will this new turn change that posture? No, look, the president and this White House still are not commenting on this. They have long stressed the independence of this investigation, and the president doesn't want to say anything that could fuel critics' claims that this has all somehow been politicized. But there is no question this is certainly not what this White House was hoping for. Just a few weeks ago, they thought this was largely behind them. Now, tonight, instead, Hunter Biden's plea deal has fallen apart, and he could be facing a criminal indictment and a trial right in the middle of his father's re-election campaign. And it is clear tonight the Biden's Republican rivals are not going to let this go. Elizabeth. Far from over. Thank you, Mary. A fifth suspect is now under arrest in connection with that wild attack which led to a brawl on the dock in Montgomery, Alabama. Reggie Ray, who was seen swinging a chair, surrendered to police and is now charged with disorderly conduct. His attorney says Ray was involuntarily pulled into the fight. The Illinois Department of Public Health reports a three-year-old died en route to the Chicago area while aboard a bus of asylum seekers on Thursday. A spokesperson said the department is working to, quote, to the fullest extent possible to get answers on this tragic situation. A source familiar with the investigation and a Brownsville City spokesperson both tell ABC News that the bus originated in Brownsville, Texas. Former President Trump's lawyers were in court today where the judge overseeing the election conspiracy case warned their client against making inflammatory statements, saying his words could backfire, pressuring her to speed up the trial. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Judge overseeing the special counsel's election interference case issued a warning today to former President Trump. I will take whatever measure, whatever measures necessary to safeguard the integrity of these proceedings, Judge Tanya Chutkin said. This comes after Trump has been accused of trying to intimidate potential witnesses, including his former vice president, Mike Pence. In one social media post, Trump said, quote, if you go after me, I'm coming after you. In court today, Judge Chutkin told Trump's lawyers, quote, to the extent your client wants to make statements on the Internet, they have to always yield to witness security and witness safety. When Trump's team said it is all about his right to free speech, the judge replied, Mr. Trump, like any American, has a right to free speech, but that right is not absolute. Trump has signaled he would not abide by any limits on what he can say about this case. I will talk about it. I will. They're not taking away my First Amendment right. Trump can talk about the case all he wants. At issue today, however, was whether there should be a so-called protective order to keep him from publicly revealing sensitive and confidential information, including secret grand jury transcripts that the special counsel is required to share with him. The judge ruled that Trump would have the same restrictions on revealing confidential information as anyone else. He's a criminal defendant, she said. He's going to have restrictions like every single other defendant. Jonathan Carl joins me now. And John, is there any indication of when this trial may start? Well, Elizabeth, the uh, special counsel has requested that the trial begin on January 2nd. That's just two weeks before the Iowa caucuses. The Trump lawyers haven't formally responded uh, with a filing on that request, but they have made it clear they think it is way too early and that it would interfere with the presidential campaign. The judge in this case will make a decision on this at the end of August, the end of this month, uh, but she made it very clear in court today that she wants a quick trial and that her decision will not be influenced by the political calendar. The political calendar and the legal calendar colliding. John Carl, thank you. FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried is officially behind bars tonight after prosecutors accused him of trying to influence witnesses. Now he'll be waiting for his trial in jail. ABC's Trevor Alt has the details. Tonight, disgraced former billionaire and cryptocurrency CEO Sam Bankman Fried sent back to jail after prosecutors accused him of giving a document to a media outlet to intimidate a witness. A judge revoking the 31 year old's $250 million bail, remanding him into the custody of U.S. Marshals. Prosecutors say Bankman Freed tried to discredit a trial witness and taint the jury pool when he shared excerpts of his ex-girlfriend Caroline Ellison's personal documents with the New York Times. 
Ellison led Bankman Freed's Alameda Research Fund. She's pleaded guilty and agreed to cooperate in the investigation into allegations Bankman Freed defrauded customers and lenders of his now bankrupt cryptocurrency company FTX. Once worth $20 billion, Bankman Freed has been awaiting trial under house arrest at the California home of his parents, seen leaving court today in New York. Do you have any comment? He's pleaded not guilty to all charges, speaking with our George Stephanopoulos late last year. I'm trying to focus on what I can do going forward to be helpful and, you know, let whatever, you know, regulatory and legal processes are happening play out as they will. Trevor Alt joins us now. And Trevor, where does Bankman Fried stand in terms of his plea? Well, Elizabeth, uh, Bankman Fried is set to go to trial in October. He's pleaded not guilty on all charges, but in the meantime, he does not plan on sitting in jail if he can change that. He's already filed an appeal of the judge's decision today to revoke his bail. Elizabeth. Trevor Alt, thank you. The Illinois Supreme Court today upheld the state's new assault weapons ban. The law was passed after seven people were killed in a 4th of July parade shooting in Highland Park last year. Challengers claimed that it violated the equal protection guarantee and other rights. The state Supreme Court today rejected those claims, but the law still faces a lawsuit claiming it violates the Second Amendment. Today, Vice President Kamala Harris was focused on gun safety in an address to young activists in Chicago. She reiterated her call for federal legislation and took aim at lawmakers who are opposing it. Millions are on alert for severe weather with the threat of large hail and damaging winds in the middle of the country and strong thunderstorms hitting the northeast tomorrow. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all. Rob? Hey, Elizabeth, we have three pockets tonight of severe weather. Georgia, Alabama, which seems to can't catch a break, a cluster down there. Also around Kansas City, that thunderstorm watches up. And one around Minneapolis, and those storms have brought 76-mile-per-hour winds. So uh, some damaging winds with that, that cluster. They should die off after midnight and then resurface tomorrow afternoon around Ohio and through West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and through New York State, and all the way into parts of New England. A big swath of damaging winds, large hail, and an isolated tornado is certainly possible through tomorrow evening. Meanwhile... The heat continues to expand across the deep south. Look at all those ex excessive heat warnings, that bright pink, but now it's expanding up into the Pacific Northwest. And places like Portland, Oregon, by Monday will be up in over 100 degrees. That is debilitating, if not dangerous, heat for the Pacific Northwest. Elizabeth? The heat just relentless this summer. Rob Marciano, thank you. And now to the Iowa State Fair, where hundreds of thousands of Iowans are converging this weekend to enjoy fried food, check out the butter cow, and be wooed by GOP presidential hopefuls. ABC's Mary Alice Parks is there. And Mary Alice, what are you hearing from the voters there? Tell me what it's like in that scene where you are right now. Oh, we've been having so much fun. I am lucky I've been riding the rides and eating all the food. But we've also been having really serious conversations with voters. You know, when you turn into the Iowa State Fairgrounds, there's a house that is flying a huge Trump flag. They have a Trump banner. And you can see the former president's campaign staff here on the ground. They have a lot of people. They have a big infrastructure here in Iowa. But I have been struck by how many Republican voters are telling us that they are really interested in hearing from the rest of the field. They want to hear what the other candidates have to say. They are telling me that they are keeping an open mind. And it was interesting to me, I even came across one couple that said they were lifelong Republicans, but they are, at this point, just not interested in voting for Trump. The former president, Trump, is not a respectable person that we would want to ever support. And of course, all the action here in Iowa this time is on the Republican side. President Biden is not facing a primary challenge, so there is just a lot of focus on what is going to happen five months from now when primary voting begins and the Iowa caucuses get underway. And a good reminder there that some of these voters are still undecided. You know, this state fair has become something of a GOP tradition, kind of a must-do event for these candidates. So is there a message that you're hearing from the candidates who have been there so far? Is there any kind of common theme you're hearing, Mary Alice? Oh, I think this has absolutely become uh, a must stop. I mean, a can't miss stop for these candidates. Because like we were saying, the Iowa caucuses are in January, they're coming up. And most of the candidates are telling me that they're so grateful for an opportunity like this. I was just talking to Miami Mayor uh, Suarez, who's running, and, and he said this feels like being back in Miami, a, a local election, because he can shake hands with people, he can meet them face to face. The voters are very aware that this is special, that only happens in Iowa, in a small state like this, where they can 
actually look so many candidates right in the eye. And the, the candidates themselves know that that is incredibly special. It's a unique opportunity. I think a lot of them are frustrated. They feel like they can't get their message out on a national stage when there are so many headlines about the criminal cases and the criminal indictments that the former president is facing. But that's the reality of this moment. Trump is still the front runner. He is still leading in the polls. And they are going to have to find a way to break through. I don't know if they're going to be able to shake enough hands to break through, but that is the question. Uh, one more thing, Elizabeth, I'll tell you, a lot of these candidates looking ahead to that first debate in just two weeks. Thank you so much, Mary Alice Parks. I hope you've got to try some of that fried food, by the way. I'm counting on you to, to eat that for us back here. <laughs> <laughs> There's still so much more to get to here on Prime. She has been all up in your mind with her Renaissance tour, but just how much more cozy with cash has Beyonce's tour made her? We will let you know. But next, they keep you dancing at clubs and bars, and sometimes they even make you ugly cry. But how exactly did DJs come to be? We will tell you all about it as we celebrate hip hop's 50th anniversary. The sound on the record, we just move it forward and back, and that's really it. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. 50 years ago today, during a party at an apartment building in the Bronx, hip hop was born. That landmark night sparked a globally respected genre that's touched almost every aspect of popular culture. And it all started with a technique created by a DJ. Through the decades, that role has evolved from a background figure to a creative force shaping hip hop music and culture. Megan Wright has that story as we close out our series commemorating 50 years of hip hop. Early. <laughs> the art of the DJ. One of the four elements of hip hop, including the MC, the B-boy, and the graffiti artist. All coming together in the Bronx to create the most popular genre of music today. The way people talk, the way people walk, the different slangs and stuff like that, the music that we listen to, I realized that I was born into a culture, into an art form that we call hip hop. Since the early days of hip hop, the DJ's role was pivotal. DJing 50 years ago was just about being the person in control of the party, being the selector and sort of guiding everyone along. Among the pioneers of DJs is the legendary Grand Wizard Theodore. First, let me say that God gave me this gift as a DJ. As a kid in the Bronx in the mid-1970s, Theodore Livingston created one of the most recognizable DJ techniques, the scratch. I was 12 years old in 1975 when I created the scratch. The scratch has three parts. It has the head, the body, and the tail. So you always want to be at the very tip. 
so you don't hear anything. Now you hear the scratch. <laughs> How did this happen? My principal played music in the loudspeakers. So a friend of mine has convinced my principal to let me make a cassette tape. So I went home, took my big boom box, put it in front of the speaker, pressed record, and I started making my cassette tape. And the music was so loud in the house to the point where my moms came and banged on the door and said, either turn the music down or turn the music off. So when my moms came in the room, that's what my scratch was. I was like, wow, I can incorporate that into, you know, all the other things I'm doing as a DJ. The introduction of scratching became a defining moment for hip hop, paving the way for future DJs to explore and innovate. The sound on the record would just move it forward and back. And that's really it. As simple as that sounds, it gave another level of expression that the DJs didn't have before. And that really changed everything. Throughout the 1970s, iconic DJs experimented with new ways to manipulate vinyl records, expanding on Theodore's technique. It went from the baby scratch to another scratch, which is called the scribble scratch, which is a faster scratch. And one other scratch called the drag scratch, which is a slower scratch. And that really solidified the musicality of what we do as DJs, learning about quarter notes, half notes, eighth notes, and everything else is, is kind of right there. Scratching joined legendary techniques like the merry-go-round from hip-hop founding father DJ Cool Herc, which looped the instrumental breakdown in records. Oh, I you, okay. And Grandmaster Flash's quick mix theory, which used scratching, backspinning, and beat juggling, as seen here in the 1986 documentary Big Fun in the Big Town. The DJ's role in hip hop is the impetus, is the nucleus of the whole thing. It doesn't happen without the DJ. Flash's innovation eventually attracted a few MCs, and together, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep going under. Formed one of the first rap groups like in hip hop history, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. There's no space for an MC to jump on a record without a DJ. There's no B boys, B girls break dancing without that break happening at the party where this is the break, the MC gets on and the D, like it just doesn't happen. <laughs> True Goy here is looping the beat. As hip hop gained popularity in the 1980s, the art of the DJ spread beyond the Bronx and found its way into mainstream culture. DJs were no longer just playing records, they were center stage, adding their unique flair to the genre. DJing is everything. Diamond the Artist credits his family for leading him to music. I got introduced to the turntables by both of my brothers. They purchased turntables, and long story short, I taught myself how to DJ. Everything I have is because of the turntables. My house, my family, my the fact that I'm in arenas two times a week still. I got, I got something for him, B. And it led to touring with superstars like Beyonce, Prince, and Kevin Hart. Try DJing for some of these super major artists. It's very, very, very intense because, like, it's our job to make the star look incredible all the time, no matter what goes on back here. As a tour DJ, Diamond the Artist is managing a show in real time. You can't have Beyonce out there not looking like Beyonce. That's, she got the beehive watching. There's two, I feel like there's, well, there's a few different types of DJs, but the two that I keep battling between which one I like to be is the DJ where I'm just bringing you into my own world, and then there's the DJs who will just play for like the crowd, like what you hear on the radio, what's like mainstream, what's popping on TikTok. Hey, what up, Nyla? What's up, guys? How are you? NYLA, yeah. big Nyla, not the little one. Nyla Simone is the youngest DJ on Power 105 in New York City. Like, I was kind of born into it, I feel like. I have like videos of my dad singing Arrested Development and like carrying me around the house. And I even started DJing in college. And then from there, I started realizing like, I think I could actually you know, like, do this. As one of the younger DJs on the scene, seeing the latest in evolution of the art form. Shout out to technology for digital music in Serato, because if if I had to carry crates, I wouldn't be a DJ. Like, I don't have time to, to do all that. No, carrying all that, no thank you. My downloading music process and discovering the music process is definitely just searching. I don't really care about it having a thousands of views or, you know, X amount of followers. If the song is dope, I'ma spin it. You know what I mean? 
It's Hot 97, uh, Ebro in the morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg. Ebro Darden emerged in the 2000s at the legendary New York radio station, Hot 97. And currently, he is also the global editorial head of hip hop and R&B for Apple Music. Why is, you know, radio important in hip hop culture and how has it evolved? I think you have to start with culture first. Black folks, we didn't see ourselves on television. And the mainstream news isn't covering our neighborhoods and covering our stories. The DJ was still a part of that kind of curation, taste-making, you know, moment. Modern technology helped to usher in the art form known as turntablism. I started teaching myself kind of both mixing and scratching. Mm -hmm. So I was teaching myself how to blend, teaching myself how to mix. I felt like I needed like a challenge to just like bump up the skills. DJ Pearlie is the first woman to win the US DMC annual DJ battle twice. I'm gonna break it down for you. For first, this is what you do now. <laughs> first, you be a badass. It gets me speechless in a good way because I never thought I was gonna be the one to be that woman to do that groundbreaking, glass ceiling shattering moment for sure. Talk to me about the preparation it takes to get ready for, you know, one of these, you know, championships. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It is stressful. A lot of people won't say it, but it is stressful. It's just hours of practice, um, just like full on focus and determination. And the Bronx native credits the women before her for paving the way to the turntables. Jazzy Joyce. Of course, Spinderella, Coco Chanel. As a woman in this space, is there anything that you can kind of like pinpoint some challenges that you have faced uh, while making your climb in this industry? People giving me a hard time because I'm a woman or just not taking me seriously because I'm a woman. I say with, with time and the more I did the work, the more confident I grew, the more I saw the results myself. There's women here in the United States, there's women here in South America, there's women all over doing great things that you shouldn't be afraid of doing in a male-dominant industry. Now, the focus is on the future, as legends like Grand Wizard Theodore give lessons at New York's Scratch DJ Academy, inspiring the next generation of DJs. I've been here at Scratch for like, woo about 22 years. I think I'm the oldest employee here. <laughs> you know, feels good to be able to come in here and, and people see me and learn how to scratch from the person that invented the scratch, so it feels real good. Our thanks to Megan Wright for that report. Still much more to get to. Coming up, retelling the origins and the aftermath of the opioid crisis. The man behind Netflix's new drama tells us how he used real events and people to bring this story to the screen. But next, it's a summer of success for Beyonce. How her Renaissance world tour is already breaking records and how much it's projected to make by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Wednesday. When you say you're going to get married on Good Morning America. I haven't said it out like yet. Say it out uh, loud. Okay, uh, I'm saying yes to marriage. <laughs> you better set a date. You're invited to one joyous bachelorette party. Celebrate Robin and her fiance. Beyonce Amber, right before they say I do. From how they first met to right now. Hi. The rest is history. Feel the love. And oh yeah, party. Yeah, let's do this. Wednesday, only on GMA. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This this is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Breaking summer renaissance for Beyonce. Fans have been flocking to her world tour starting earlier this year in Europe and now playing in cities across North America. It's on track for major earnings and has already broken some major records. We take a look at the renaissance world tour by the numbers. According to Billboard's touring data, the entire European leg earned $154 million for Beyonce, proving she's that girl no matter where she goes. In case you think America has a problem, she's earned $141 million from just the first 12 Renaissance tours in North America, with more performance dates stretching until October. With about $295 million in total sales so far, this is now Beyonce's highest grossing tour yet, and the highest for any black artist since Billboard starting collecting tour data from more than four decades ago. As of August 1st, 1.6 million tickets have been sold, with fans flocking to stadiums, risking getting heated by these summer temperatures. This Virgo has hit her groove, earning an average of nearly $12 million a night. The most lucrative were her two shows in East Rutherford, New Jersey. They both grossed a total of $33 million for the superstar. The energy is only building. The entire tour projected to hit $500 million, thanks in part to upcoming anticipated shows in Atlanta, Los Angeles, and her hometown of Houston, and if it reaches $525 million, it would enter the list of the top 10 highest grossing tours of all time. Much more ahead here on Prime, the heroic rescue after a six-year-old falls 30 feet off a roller coaster. It's a fictionalized telling of the real events behind the origins and aftermath of the opioid crisis in America. We take you behind the latest major series, Painkiller. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? 
going to the front line. They'll search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Self-driving taxis, a small win for Trump in court, and cheaper diamonds. These stores might, these stories and more in tonight's rundown. a small win in court for former President Trump as a judge in Washington, D.C. sided with his lawyers against a blanket restriction on what he can publicly share about evidence and testimony in the January 6th case. Judge issuing a protection order only regarding highly sensitive materials, the decision Trump's lawyers wanted. They're fighting it because they essentially say it violates his First Amendment rights, which, again, isn't totally a, a, an argument that prosecutors are willing to accept given that there are these protective orders in in other cases, if in the classified documents case, there's a protective order. We didn't hear any debate uh, about that. So that's what Trump is saying. All the statements that needed to be made were made on the record. Ukraine's President Zelensky has fired every single regional military enlistment chief across the embattled country amid a major corruption scandal. Some of these officers are accused of taking bribes so people can dodge military enlistment and leave the country. And Zelensky says the way they treat actual warriors is immoral. Russia is on its way to the moon for the first time in nearly 50 years. An unmanned spacecraft launching today. It's expected to reach the moon in 12 days, about the same time as a craft from India. Those two nations aiming to be the first to land near the moon's south pole. California regulators have cleared the way for robo-taxis to offer pay rides in San Francisco 24-7 despite pushback from city officials. Now two driverless car service companies will be competing for passengers against ride-hailing services and regular taxis. There were concerns over incidents where the unmanned cars blocked traffic and emergency vehicles.
A major chain hopes music gets people to move out the door. Walgreens is now blasting classical music to get loiterers to hit the road. There's no data to back up this idea, but some customers say the Bach and Beethoven appears to work. 7-Elevens in the Windy City are doing it as well. This sounds a little dark, like the Phantom of the Opera-like stuff, you know, but... I guess you gotta start somewhere. I thought maybe their system was like stuck playing the same track over and over again from Halloween or something like that. If diamonds are a girl's best friend, ladies, you will want to listen to this. Despite lingering inflation in the country, diamond prices are actually on the decline. The diamond industry saw its highest prices the past two years, but now they're down about 27% from just last year. Experts believe it's due to demand slowing down post-pandemic and also supply chain issues resolve themselves, but they don't think these lower prices will last long. And we want to update you on the devastation out of Hawaii. As we learn, the death toll there has risen to at least 67 confirmed deaths from the wildfires, making it the worst loss of a life from natural disaster since Hawaii became a state. That update comes as we learn more about the search and rescue mission and the people the Coast Guard had to pull from the water. Take a listen. Tuesday evening, the 45-foot responsible medium crew arrived on scene and rescued 17 survivors from the waters in the vicinity of Lahaina Harbor, with all survivors reported to be in stable condition. The governor speaking a little while ago, saying he expects the death toll, unfortunately, will continue to rise. Tonight, we've got a new view into dramatic events that saved a little boy after some wild body camera footage and urgent 911 calls were released detailing the heroic work to save the six-year-old who fell off a Florida roller coaster. ABC's Victor Akendo has more. The newly released police body camera footage showing the race to rescue a six-year-old boy who fell from a roller coaster in Central Florida. The tense moments as paramedics helped the boy who suffered injuries before transporting him to the hospital. No, it was a complete accident. He like, he even, he double checked, but the seats, he's tiny. And the seats can only go, like there's still a little gap if you're skinny. He's a tiny boy. Bystanders describing what they saw. So you seen it happen? My sister down? saw it. And we were, I was on the ride right before him. Gotcha. And that thing is very jerky. Yeah, and it jerks you. Hey, it's I'll a really jerky out. ride. 911, where's the emergency? You need to come to Fun Spot Orlando. This poor child fell off a f***ing roller coaster. Multiple calls to 911. This one from a park employee. The child fell off the ride. Right now we have him on the floor. They're screaming. We're trying our best not to move them, and we need someone to judge. Okay, are they breathing? Yes, he's breathing. He's bleeding from his lips. On his top left corner of his head is very swollen. Do not move him unless he is in danger. It happened at Fun Spot in Kissimmee last week. The six year old was on the Galaxy Spin roller coaster. The police report states he could have fallen from as high as 30 feet and fell underneath the tracks. Our thanks to Victor Akendo. Time for our series, Streamlined, where we take you behind the scenes of some of the biggest films and TV series. Netflix's new drama, limited series, Painkiller, is a fictionalized retelling of the origins and aftermath of the opioid crisis in America. Inspired by true events and people, the series follows the victims and perpetrators whose lives have been altered by Purdue Pharma, the business behind OxyContin. Let's take a look. All of human behavior is essentially comprised of two things. Run from pain, run toward pleasure. Pain, pleasure, pain, pleasure. If we place ourselves right there between pain and pleasure, we will never have to worry about money again. Joining us now is director and executive producer of Painkiller, Peter Berg. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Peter. Thank you for having me. You know, the opioid crisis is a sensitive, personal topic for so many families. So. I just want to start with what motivated you to bring this story to the screen. Um, so a friend of mine, Eric Newman, who kind of was executive producer and who started organizing this story, came to me and asked me if I wanted to do something about Oxycontin and opioids. And I thought about it and I, I started counting the people that, that I knew that have died from opioids. And I quickly got off both hands. I knew more than 10 people and I started thinking about 
the amount of people I knew that have died. And so I feel like I, I have so much direct connection to opioids. I'm sure you know people. If you don't, you know people who do. And it was something I felt very strong about. Well, and, and Painkiller is looking at this from several perspectives, right? The top executives of these pharmaceutical companies to those sales reps, kind of the everyday people. So. Talk about the decision to feature those different stories and then how do you balance that right. to be accurate? Well, so, so the opioid epidemic is a very complex web that you know is really fueled by, in this case, Purdue Pharma, the company that made OxyContin, and the Sackler brothers, Richard Sackler in particular, who is sort of the mastermind behind the entire um, project. And we wanted to make sure that in addition to showing people getting addicted to the drugs and showing people from the Department of Justice trying to figure out how to prosecute it, that we really made sure that people got a look at how a big pharma company was able to, you know, get heroin into the hands of hundreds of thousands. Let's take another look at painkiller and get into that more. Okay. You will be convincing doctors to take pain seriously. Oh, oh, oh. Oxycontin is the one to start with and the one to stay with. The more you prescribe, the more you'll help. It is now the number one opioid in the country. This drug is permeating every part of our community. What kind of research do you have to do to get into those stories right. and to feel like you're doing this justice to people who are watching, all of us who know someone affected by the crisis? Um, so, so doing research about the Sackler family is actually quite difficult. So in the case of um, Painkiller, we relied on a book called Painkiller written by a very talented journalist, author, a gentleman named Barry Meyer, who spent decades studying the, um, the Sacklers and the opioid crisis. And that book gave, gave us a lot of information. Um, and then talking to folks at the Department of Justice who tried to prosecute them um, and spending time with families of uh, children who have died of Oxycontin overdoses, um, as well as you know, our lead actor, Taylor Kitsch, or one of our leads, uh, his sister, he's, he's very public about this, battled a very intense Oxycontin uh, addiction for six years. She beat it, thankfully, and she was on set every day, kind of keeping an eye on me. Did you feel like there was a connection on set because of those personal ties? I, I, I think so. And, and one of the things I found interesting about shooting <clears throat> Painkiller, we were up in Toronto for four months filming, and rarely a day went by when a crew member wouldn't kind of wait for a quiet moment, take me aside and say, hey, you know, I just want to let you know my, my, my nephew died of Oxycontin. My, my mother-in-law is addicted to Oxycontin. Um, everyone had a story. And if it wasn't a personal story about, you know, that they actually had taken it or someone in their immediate family had, they know someone who has. Um, it's, a, it's a real epidemic. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Painkiller is now streaming on Netflix. That is our show for tonight. I'm Elizabeth Schulze. ABC News Live is here for you all night with all the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, and the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. With all that's happening. Bring me your friends. Everything I really need to know. A place as awesome and as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Good morning, America. Now that's how you start your day, people. Yep, bring your friends. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hip-hop is a beautiful art form that continues to evolve, and that is the very definition of freedom. It's music that was made by poor people. And so it became the language for the youth. It became the education for the youth. It became so much for us. My love note to hip-hop would be happy 50th. Hip-hop at 50 is, uh... It's fresh and refreshing, man. It was a genre that wasn't going to make it. Now, nothing can be pushed in the world without having hip hop involved. It has influenced every single industry across the globe. Technology, art, language, fashion. I think hip hop has evolved from just being the worker to being an owner. I love seeing the woman today. I think there's a lot more women that have existed in hip hop than ever before at the same time. Hip hop is one of the most beautiful things I believe that was ever invented. Shout out to Cool Herc. It's the number one genre in the world. It connects everybody. Hip hop is part of the fabric of who I am. And so at every point in my life, I can pinpoint a moment inside hip hop culture that helped to shape me. Congratulations on your first 50 years. You've always been beautiful. What would I say to hip hop? Thank you for being my real first love. Dear hip hop, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm glad I found you. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the world to all of us, and we just want to keep feeding you so that you can go around the world, around the world, and around the world. You're watching Hip Hop at 50. Rhythms, rhymes, and reflections. you know we're celebrating Juneteenth and um, just the impact of hip-hop 50 years of having a voice that we've used in so many different ways but when we go back to hip-hop's beginning 1973 we have the first house party where Cool Herc is DJing and sparks the sound of hip-hop and by the end of the decade I mean we had evolved so much sonically that we started to see hit records like Sugar Hill Gang's Rapper's Delight was huge. Now what you hear is not a test, I'm rapping to the beat. When did you first realize that hip-hop was more than just music? You could date it back to the message. The message with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five with Melly Mel. You grow in the ghetto living second rate and your eyes will sing a song of deep hate. They were the first, that was the first conscious hit record. The end of the video of the message, they get locked up in the back of the police car. Like, yo, we ain't do it. We ain't, do, you know. Yeah. And so it, it's a strong message. It was super strong. It was the first time I remember seeing a, a, a video or a song where that's 
somebody's talking about what that what what the, the real struggle looks like. It's saying to America, you don't really know who we are. So let me tell you, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. And that song helped us understand the drug addiction, the crime, the seedy underclass, and the culture of the city that made life hell for many uh, inhabitants. We was voiceless. And so that's why, you know, I speak up for so many of the people where I grew up is because we used to get abused by the police. It wasn't no social media where you could turn the camera on. Mm. Wow. Imagine we didn't have hip hop. Imagine we didn't have that voice. I must have been five years old, you know, eight years old at the time. And you could realize that this was something that was crossing cultures and crossing languages. You know, and it was, as you say, in the plight of our people. And then as I got older to KRS-One, um, self-destruction. Ooh. It was the first time I remember seeing a collective where we unified and you saw the power of people coming together and it was, for me, it was super powerful to see that. We got ourselves together so that you could unite and fight for what's right. You got Martin Luther King, you got Malcolm X, you got Kennedys. Anybody that was speaking up for justice, they was getting knocked off. True. So when you look back at Public Enemy, you say, like, damn, these guys was, like, putting themselves in the line of fire. One of the most successful rap groups of the decade, Public Enemy, has also drawn severe criticism. Public Enemy is the group that wrote Fight the Power, the theme song for the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. They were giving me my own culture back. Hmm. When the school system wasn't doing it, I learned more about myself and my people through Chuck D. I say it all, that any any syllabus I had until I got to college. You know what was dope, too, is the way that we would learn about different places. And you think about, like, NWA coming out. I never traveled outside of New York. I didn't, I didn't know what the hood in the West Coast even looked like. So it was like social media, right? It was like a news network in some type mm. of way. I feel like hip-hop educated us. NWA, I, I, I'm more relate. I'm trying to keep this ungangster as possible. No, but... but I related in a major way to NWA. <laughs> hip-hop, you know, people had their own story to tell all around the country. The Los Angeles rap group NWA drew fire from police because its album Straight Outta Compton talked in brutal and vulgar language about retaliating against cops for their anti-gang sweeps in the L.A. area. Police coming straight from the underground. A young got it back because I'm brown. And not the other colors. Every word was measured. And think about it. That song comes out 88 and then Rodney King in 92. We're talking about the videotaped beating of Rodney King. When you think about the Rodney King 